How can you not love that man? Very first thing he did when I came on campus was pray for me. I don't know what Sabbath school is like in your churches, but, but my personal belief that Sabbath school is something when we read our Sabbath school lesson, the Lord has already taught us the lesson. When we come together for Sabbath school, it's more or less to see what we've learned. And the only way that happens is when you all share, and I don't have to do all the talking. Now, there's a few things different about this quarterly for myself than, than I've ever had to deal with before. Number one was for Elder Tim to ask me to teach Sabbath school, so I'm out of my comfort zone. How many of you like to be up in front of crowds? How many of you know everything there is to know in the Bible? So I'm in good company, obviously. The second thing that, that was different about this quarterly is about halfway through our study in Genesis, I get a phone call from a fellow I used to work with. I guess I ought to carry this with me. He calls me from his head. Is it on? Is on? Okay. He, he calls me from Florida. He's on vacation with his family, with his mother. His dad had recently passed away. And he calls me up and says, Bernie, I want you to let you know something. Something has come over me, a feeling that I've never had before, to start reading the Bible. Now, I'd given this man a Bible several years ago. And here he is calling me up in the middle of our study of Genesis that I'm studying the Bible for the first time. And he says, Bernie, I've been reading it, but I got a lot of questions. Is there any chance we can get together and you can help me answer some of my questions? I said, sure, that'd be great. And he says, I just got done studying. I've decided to start from the beginning of the Bible. I've just got done, done starting reading Genesis, and I've got questions for you. What was the timing of Genesis being the, his questions? Here I am in the middle of the study, you guys may be in the middle, but since I'm nervous and I've got to teach the last week of the lesson, I'm going ahead of myself. So here I am, I go to his house when he gets back from vacation, he's got two long pages of questions for me. And I'm looking up to heaven, Lord, you got to help me with all this. When I left that house over two and a half hours later, I was, had a little bounce in my step because I was able to answer every single one of his questions. God is so good, and his timing is always nothing but perfect. Amen? There was one other thing that I wasn't planning, that wasn't really included in today's study, but I just talked to a fellow the other day, and he is an oil and gas inspector. Anybody knows anything about the oil and gas? It's a very lucrative business, and he, being an inspector, is a very, very well-paid job. And he has put all of his time and energy into this job. He's an Adventist. But in the oil and gas business, you know that they work 24-7. And even though he was an Adventist, he wasn't able to keep the Sabbath because that was part of their job requirement. He worshiped with us in Weirton when he could. But then he decided, when he was getting ready to move on to Kentucky here, he decided that I can't do this any longer. And you know when you make that commitment to God, God is there with you. Now, he got all the way to the end of all of his savings. Everything had run out. And guess what happens? He gets a phone call from, actually it was local. He says, any chance I can get a room in your house because I got a job bid for the pipelines near your house. And he said, well, they said they could work with the Sabbath. Two weeks later, they said, we need you to work on the Sabbath. He said, I told you that I can. Two days later, or next day later, I think it was, they said we worked it out. He was able to work through it. He goes back home, and then all of a sudden, his money runs out again. He says, you're not going to believe this. My money ran out again. I'm claiming the promises of God, and I get a phone call again. I get a phone call from somebody up in Minnesota. He says, I need an oil and gas inspector. And I see one of your requirements is you can't work on the Sabbath. You must be an Adventist. Turns out that the man is actually a former, he grew up an Adventist. And he knows all about the Sabbath. And he said, I'll work with you. I really need you. 
Praise God. You know, these jobs should be closed. This is an impossible situation. And yet God can always do the impossible. Amen? The third thing is, just prior to us beginning our study here, I heard something from a fellow by the name of Andy Stanley. Anybody know who Andy Stanley is? He's the son of Dr. Charles Stanley. Does that ring a bell? Okay. Well, he made a comment, and it aroused my interest, so I had to read the article. He made a comment that he felt that it's come time that we should probably unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. What does unhitch mean? Separate yourself. So his comment was, and I want to quote him here, he says, while he believes that the Old Testament is divinely inspired, he said, it should not be the go-to source regarding any behavior in the church. That's what he said. He's, he's, in his article, he alludes to that the Old Testament portrays God as a brutal God. Well, okay. I'm glad you feel that way. I also caught an article at about the same time from the New York Times. He said in this article, he said, in the times of war, he's talking about the Ukraine war. Everybody knows about that. He says, I propose we give up God. He said that the followers of a brutal God is why we have wars today. You know, in 1 John 4, verse 8, it says what? If we know him, if we, wait a second. If we, know, if we love not, we know not God, for God is love. Do you believe that? If that's true, then that same God is all the way through the Bible. Amen? Well, I'm going to ask you to help me out with that this morning before I go to prayer here. Because I believe that also. So let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I've been praising you for quite a while. I've been asking for prayers from as many people as, as I could ask for this moment. Because, Father God, it is so important for the people of God to not only be willing to tell people that that same God of love that John the Apostle learned from Jesus, as we have learned from Jesus, that same God of love exists in the book of Genesis. And if we are willing, we must also be able so I pray, Father God, that you would search our hearts this morning with the blood of Jesus and give us pure hearts to receive your spirit this morning, that what is said and done will truly be done according to your word. Speak to our hearts, and I pray, Father God, that whatever is said and done here, it's not from me, but it's from you. For I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In creation, after each day, how does God end each day? He said it's good. Now, I've always understand what he, understood what he said, it was good, that it was perfect, right? But I think it means more than that. Who was it perfect for? He said, be fruitful and multiply, so that means all of us, Amen. Each day, he took pride in creating something perfect for you and me. And then when we came along, he said it was what? Very good. It sure was. That's the God of love. But then sin comes along. How did God handle sin? He, what's the first thing he did? He came searching for him. Didn't the salvation process start up immediately? Okay. 
Well, I'm going to read from Genesis 3.15. I think you all remember the prophecy, the promise. Because the curse of sin is what it is. You know, we all know what, what sin does. It, there is a curse for sin. But God said in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's all God is concerned about. Saving. Because he loves but now let's get into Cain. Where is the God of love when it comes to Cain? <laughs> Trying to reason with them. If you read those words from Genesis 4, there is not one parent here who could have talked to their child any gentler, any more patient, and any more loving and heartache. You can hear the heartache in the very words that he says here, and I'll say them for you. And the Lord said unto Cain, why are you angry? Does God wait till that anger turns into hatred, turns into violence? No, he comes right, right there seeking to save him. Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shalt you not be accepted? Listen to the tone of his voice, not mine. If thou doest well, sins lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Sadly, Cain couldn't be rescued at that time. So what about Enoch? Doesn't it say that Enoch walked with God? What's it mean to walk with God? Have a relationship with him. How do you have a relationship with him? Get to know him. How did Enoch get to know God? He talked to him. Who did, who did Enoch know? Who could Enoch have talked to to find out more about God? Adam. You know that Adam was 622 years old when Enoch was born? He still had a long way to go. My wife and I, we've been married 19 years, and I keep teasing her. We only need 31 more for our golden anniversary. It'll be a race to see which one of us makes it. <laughs> okay. What does it mean to walk with God, though? You know, I think about when two people fall in love, they walk down the aisle together. They're in love, right? They are in love because of how they know each other. And like the fellow was talking about last night, sometimes we don't know enough about each other to really be in love. So Adam, what was Adam able to tell Enoch about God? What's that? God is love. Wasn't he able to walk in the garden with Adam? Wasn't he able to talk with God? I mean, what was the purpose of God creating this world if it wasn't for the purpose of loving you and me, to talk to you and me. You know, you think about when, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the of Garden of Eden, what we lost. Think about what God lost. He lost what he loved the most, having face-to-face -face communion with you and me. And he's waited 6,000 years for that to be restored. So you can imagine the Father's love in this. And I can imagine that Adam also told God how God handled them when they sinned, how God handled Cain when he sinned. What about Noah? It said that he walked with God also. How did he know about God? Where did he hear from? Enoch. Believe it or not, uh, Noah's daddy, Lamech, was 56 years old when Adam died. So he, he could have had firsthand information again from his dad, from his grandfather. You know, grandfather Methuselah, he lived all the way up to the flood. So they had firsthand knowledge of the love of God. So what about the flood? Where is the God of love when it comes to the flood? How do you explain that? Emergency measure. Emergency measure. 
Jerry, when you corrected your kids, how long did you expect them to straighten up? How long did you give them to straighten up? Very little time. Would you have given them 120 years? But he does. Because he's a God of love. Yeah. So we might call that overkill today, 120 years. But not for God. Not for God. Now we could talk about Abraham. You know, we, we, we saw what happened when... The Lord and the two angels were coming by his tent on their way to Sodom. We see in that story we can actually reason with God, even if we're clueless. Abraham didn't know the situation. He was just pleading with God, and God listens. Doesn't he listen to everything? But my favorite story is the story about Jacob. What kind of person was Jacob? deceiver you know would you treat your brother the way Jacob treated his brother when he was starving that was cruel but Jacob wanted something in return if you want something to eat you got to give me something that was cruel then how how did Jacob treat well that's let's, let's reword this let's let's look at what happened when Jacob went to get after the Lord's blessing. How did he do that? What did he do to his brother again? He stole it from his brother again. And then he deceived his own father. And then he also, when, when uh, Isaac asked him about the venison, how'd you get it so quick? He said, the Lord has provided. So he took the Lord's name in vain. So what kind of person was Jacob? He wasn't such a good person. Not trying to pass judgment, but he wasn't such a good person at that point in time. And then, of course, we know the story of how Esau made the threats that when daddy dies, I'm going to take care of Jacob. Mother gets wind of that, tells dad, and then they come up with the idea that Jacob needs to go away and get himself a wife. But what happens when he leaves Beersheba? What's that? Well, he actually goes to sleep that night, and the Lord appears to him. And that's when the Jacob's ladder takes place. We all know the story. What did Jacob do to deserve that? Nothing. Did he come seeking the Lord, or was it the other way around? That's a God of love. That's all you see in Genesis over and over again, a God of love. And finally, I want to take a look at, at Joseph so we can get into our lesson here. Joseph is treated horribly by his, his brothers. Joseph sold into slavery. Joseph sold to Potiphar. And then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, falsely accuses him. And what does, Paul, what does uh, Joseph say? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? How do you say something like that if you are not in love with that same God? You don't. You don't. So let's look into... Now that we've done a quick review, let's, let's get started on our lesson. And I'd like you, if you have your Bibles or your phones, or whatever you're using these days, to open up to uh, Genesis chapter 45, and we're going to start at the end of the chapter. And before we do that, even, as you open your Bibles, I want you to ponder a thought for me, and hopefully we'll find the answer as we go through the lesson. Abraham is led to the promised land, and right away there's a famine. Where does Abraham go? He runs off to Egypt. Was he supposed to go to Egypt? No. Wasn't supposed to go to Egypt. Didn't work out so well when he tried to claim that uh, his wife Sarah was his sister. And then pa uh, Pharaoh got wind of it and he kicked him out of Egypt. Isaac. 
Caught has a famine in his lifetime, and he wanted to go to Egypt also. And the Lord God said, no. Sends him to the Philistine king, Abimelech, ends up in some territory by the name of Gerar, and eventually when there's some fighting over some of the, of the wells and stuff like that, he ends up in Beersheba. So he wasn't supposed to go to Egypt either. If you read further in Deuteronomy, Moses was told that the people of God were never to go back to Egypt. My question is to you now, is why is Jacob and his family being led to Egypt? Why Egypt? Why now? So please keep that thought in mind. So let's look at Genesis 45, verse 24. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed, and he said unto them, See that ye not fall out by the way. What's he saying here? Don't quarrel. Don't quarrel. What would they be quarreling about? What's that? What Benjamin, what Benjamin was given? They got to go home and talk to dad. They got to tell him about Joseph being alive. Who's going to tell? How are you going to tell it? What all are you going to be able to say? And Joseph, knowing his brothers, you know, some hotheads, short tempers, and, you know, it may have been 22 years ago, but he hasn't forgotten. So he tells them, don't quarrel along the way. Okay. And then he says, and they went up out of Egypt, and they came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is a governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. Was it enough for them to just say, Joseph's alive? If you knew somebody that's been dead for 22 years, and somebody comes along and tells you they're alive, would you jump on the bandwagon? It's too good to be true. Amen? Okay. So let's finish. Verse 27. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive, and I will go and see him before I die. So what did they tell him? It says whatever Joseph said. And what did Joseph say? He said, you meant this for evil. God meant this for good. You know? So they had to tell him the whole story. It's good to come forward with the truth and get past it. Amen? Okay. Well, let's see what happens next. Let's go turn to chapter 46. Something happens here. Now, don't forget Joseph's excited now, all right? How could he be more euphoric to know that his son Joseph, uh, Jacob, more than to know that his son Joseph's alive, okay? And he also knows that the food is in Egypt, so he has all the motivation in the world to go to Egypt, okay? So let's look at 46 verse 1. And Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba. How, have you heard that word Beersheba? It's kind of where they... Isaac, the family, kind of spent their time. And God spake unto Israel in the vision of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will be there to make of thee a great nation. What's Jacob got to be afraid of? What's that? Okay. There was a prophecy given to Abraham in accordance with what Cherry just shared with us. Genesis 15, verse 13 reads, And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them for 400 years. 
Now, mind you, Joseph wants to go to Egypt. He wants to see or Jacob. Jacob wants to see Joseph. And yet, he hesitates. Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing my will, which is what I've done in the past, or am I going to be doing God's will? Jacob has surely changed, amen? So God tells him that I will be with you. And then it says, I'm even going to go down with you into Egypt. And I shall also bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hands upon thine eyes. Now, when you look back at, at Jacob, God was with him when he didn't know him. And then when he had to go back and face his sins and face up to Esau, God was there again. Here is Joseph struggling with his thoughts, should I go to Egypt? And God shows up again. What's the, pro the promise that I probably use more than any other promise, and I hope you do too in Hebrews, I will never leave you nor forsake you. No matter what you've done, turn to me. If we go a little further in chapter 46, go down to verse 31, we know that God has promised Jacob that I'm going to bring you up out of Egypt. And what does he say in verse, oh no, no, that, I'm ahead of myself. Verse 31, this is kind of the clue that, that, that has a lot to do with why God is sending his people to Egypt. Verse 31, it says, And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, my brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade had been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? Here's the key. That you shall say, Thy servant's trade has been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is what? An abomination unto the Egyptians. So remember that. So it says, to finish out Sunday's lesson, it says that the family of Jake, or Jacob comprised of 70 there's that seven, that perfect number. Isn't that amazing? But I come up with something else. When it came to going before the Pharaoh, Jacob has, or Joseph has, 11 brothers. And yet he only takes five with him to go before Pharaoh. So I counted up five brothers, Joseph and Jacob, going before Pharaoh. There's seven. There's that perfect number again. Isn't that amazing? What's it say? If God be for us, who can be against us? So they were powerful, even before the throne of Pharaoh. So they go before the Pharaoh in, verse, in chapter 47. And they ex say exactly what, what uh, Joseph had told his brothers to say. And Pharaoh says, I'm going to give you the land of Goshen. And it says that the land of Goshen was the best land in all of Egypt. It was fertile. It was perfect for them to thrive. So I ask you again, why Egypt? Why now? It's because of God bringing his family into Egypt, into the land of Goshen, abomination to the rest of the Egyptians, separated. Remember it says... You know, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. God made provision for them to be truly separated. They thrived, and they became a nation. That would not have been possible 
living outside of Egypt. Because inside of Egypt, they were protected. They had everything they needed, and they thrived. So much so, they even outnumbered the Egyptians, and that's where the persecution started. Moving on to Tuesday's lesson. Chapter 48 in your Bibles. Joseph gets word that Jacob is dying. So Joseph gathers his two sons, Manasseh, the oldest, and Ephraim. And he brings them before his father. And keep in mind that Joseph is to get a double portion. Amen. So he brings his sons before his father. Oh, I skipped something here. I'm going to go back to Monday's lesson. Joseph brings his father before Pharaoh. And Jacob blesses Pharaoh. Is it right to bless the ungodly? God does. Everybody agree? Well, I'm going to read... From Genesis, the promise that was made to Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 3 says, And I will bless them that bless thee. Did Pharaoh bless the people of God? Yes. He certainly did. And I'm going to curse those that curse thee. And in thee all families of the earth shall be blessed. That's an important lesson to learn. To bless those who bless you. Okay, now let's move on to 48. The Tuesday's lesson. Back to Manasseh and Ephraim. Verse 9 in chapter 48 says, And Joseph said unto his father, That's not what I wanted. But anyway, Joseph brings his children before him. And you know that Joseph, or Jacob by now, he's getting fairly old, getting ready to die. Eyesight's not too good. So Joseph helps him out, puts the, the oldest son in front of his right hand, puts the younger son in front of his left hand. You know how the story works out, right? Joseph ends up crossing his hands. Or Jacob does. And what does Joseph do? F Father, he, 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 this, is not, this is not right. He, he, Manasseh is the firstborn. And then Jacob says, I know. But God is not a respecter of person, position, anything like that. God said that Manasseh will be a great nation. But Ephraim will be a greater nation still. It's just like today. Russia is a great nation. But the USA is a greater, greater nation still. Why? Because we lead. Now, do we have any evidence that Ephraim became a greater nation? What about the 12 spies that went in to search out this promised land? Ten went out, giants, big walls, can't do. Two came back and said, with the Lord, we can do whatever he wants. Who were those two? Joshua and Caleb. What tribe was Caleb from? Jo Caleb was from Judah. What tribe was Joshua from? Ephraim. There you go. God knows the end from the beginning. Amen? Isn't that amazing? Then it comes time for... Jacob's sons to come for their blessing. Who's the firstborn? 
Reuben, let's look at chapter 49. Verse 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, thy might, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. He had everything going for him. And yet it says, Reuben, you're unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest it. He went up to my couch. We know what Reuben did, right? Rachel dies. Right after Rachel dies, Reuben goes after Rachel's concubine, Bilhah, and sleeps with her. Horrible. Mother of two of his own brothers. Horrible what he did. But is there any more evidence in the scriptures to give us an idea that Reuben was truly unstable? Do you remember when Joseph was going to be killed? Reuben says, ah, I'm going to come back and rescue him. You know, I'll make sure that he, my, you know, my brother's okay. And dad, you know, he'll be happy that you know, we didn't do anything to Joseph. Reuben comes back after Joseph's already been sent off to slavery. What's Reuben do? He didn't do anything. Did he go after his brother? Yeah. Did, did he object to his brother being sold off to slavery? Uh, did he get part of the money problem they, they got from the slavery? You know, one minute he's ready to do what's right, and the next minute, whatever the crowd says. And then what about when the boys came back from Joseph knowing that they had to bring their brother Benjamin back if they was ever to get any more food? What did Reuben say to Dad to try to talk him into let, let Benjamin come with us? You can kill my sons, which would be his own grandsons. How is that supposed to make a grandfather, a father, feel any better? He truly was unstable as water, and therefore he did lose his blessing. But then we come to the next two. And, and mind you, if you look at it, all the individual brothers were all one at a time with the exception of the next two. And they were linked together for a reason. Simeon and Levi, what did they do? What's that? Their cruelty at Shechem. Remember when Dina was uh, seduced? They tried to make it right in their own eyes, and they killed all the men in Shechem. And it says here what? Cursed. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, you know as well as I do, when you do certain sins, sometimes you have to live with that scar the rest of your life. Sometimes when you know somebody has stolen something, that's a thief. Somebody that's known for lying, yeah, they're nothing but a liar a prostitute, you know, some scars you live with. Does it have to stay that way with God? Does it stay that way with the tribe of Levi? What changes? They become the priesthood. Do you remember when they came down from, when Moses came down from the mount with the Ten Commandments and the people were out there worshiping the golden calf? What tribe stood up with Moses? The tribe of Levi. Anybody can turn the corner. All you got to do is turn in God's direction. And there's proof. But then we come down to the next tribe, to, to the next son, and that would be the fourth son who truly gets the blessing of the first son, and that is Judah. And you can read all there is to, to Judah here. You know, I don't want to run out of time here. But uh, what kind of person was Judah? Wasn't he the one when he came up with the idea, what are we going to kill Joseph for? There's no profit in that. That was his brainstorm. Let's make some money off the deal. And then what about Tamar? What about Tamar? You remember Tamar? She was his daughter-in-law. 
She was without child to the first son, the oldest son, second son. I don't want anything to do with her. He ends up dying. And then the third son is too young. So he forgot all about his responsibility to Tamar. And then Judah, his wife dies. He gets one of his friends. They go off to town looking for a prostitute. Looking for a prostitute. And who does he end up being deceived by? Tamar, his own daughter-in-law. And yet, she gets pregnant. Judah gets word of it. What's supposed to happen to Tamar? Got to kill her. Look how sinful she is. Look what she's done wrong. And then, of course, she brings in his staff and his ring. And what does Judah say? You are more righteous than I. I think that's a golden moment for Judah, don't you? So then you see after that that Judah, if you look at when they, when they go to Egypt to talk to the Pharaoh, who's doing the talking? It's Judah. When they come back to his father to try to reason with him to take Benjamin, who's the one that talks him into it? It's Judah. When they leave for Egypt with their dad to go to Egypt, who is leading the family? It's Judah. Once again, you have more proof that when God comes into your life, anyone can change. Amen. Moving on to Thursday's lesson. Jacob's time has come. He passes away. The promise made by Joseph is to take him home. They get permission from Pharaoh, and they take him home. Where do they bury him? Yes, in the promised land. In the promised land. When Joseph dies, where do they bury him? Because he's waiting for the promised land. Doesn't that include all of us? Waiting for the promised land. This world is not my home. We're just passing through. But here is a very important point to finish with. Joseph or Jacob, when he dies, the boys get nervous. What do they get nervous for? They think that now Joseph would like to get his revenge for what they've done. Hadn't they already been forgiven? What happens when we're forgiven? Where does their sins go? To the depths of the sea, never to be seen again. Do you believe that? With God, yes. And that's extremely important to believe that your sins are truly forgiven because you see in this here that Satan wants you to not believe that your sins are forgiven and when the time is right he is going to resurrect the memory of your sins and accuse you once more they struggled they were scared what did they do they sent a letter then they come back and they bowed before him you know, what does Joseph say? Absolutely. And he also said, for am I in the place of God? How can I do any less than what God has already forgiven you? How can I do any less? Think about what it's going to be like in these last days. When the Spirit of God is slowly being withdrawn from the earth. Is that not Satan's secret weapon to bring up the memory of your sins and accuse you once more? Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus has already been here. Let's bow our heads for a moment.
Father God, you are a God of love. I pray, Father God, that those of us who have studied the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, the book that shows us the very truthfulness in, in so many of our forefathers' lives, how they look to you in getting to know you as a God of love, they fell in love with you themselves. May that be said of each one of us. The promised land is guaranteed for all those who love him. Please, Heavenly Father, remember us when you come into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.